Uh, and that means we're, we're starting our last session. I can't believe this is the last session. Of course, it's not over. We got the awards, but that's kind of like celebrating after, after a, a couple of great days of, of talks. And so I'm really excited for this one. Uh, but I'm not going to say too much about it. I'm going to leave that to James Bird. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about James Bird, the moderator for our keynote session. Um, James is a member of the Denis Sultan Nation and affiliated with the Northwest Territory Metis Nation. He holds an honors BA, a master's degree in architecture, and currently working on a PhD in architecture. He's also a Red Seal carpenter and cabinet maker. Uh, his current work examines the intersection between indigenous languages and shape forming using parametrics and algorithms. The research was supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for research in linguistics and architecture in the Dene language. James was part of a team headed by world-renowned indigenous architect Douglas Cardinal and 18 other indigenous architects that won the 2018 Venice Architectural Biennale for Canada. He's a member of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada's Indigenous Task Force on Architecture. James, I'd like to invite you up to the stage. for that generous introduction. Um, yes, I can. I wanted to make sure I can read this without my glasses. It's my great pleasure this afternoon to um, introduce Seiko Cook, who is um, pretty impressive, as you'll see by his bio. Um, and it's a great pleasure that I'm here. I'm on the lands of the Mississaugas the credit, the Haudenosaunee, um, on the dish of what's one spoon, traditional area. And uh, it's my tradition to introduce myself in my language first with my lineage. Uh, that's how we proceed um, as indigenous people. So, Dene Sutane, Akleretia, Otono Setejiche, Moksana Zosete, Untlana Jesse, James Bird. That is my English name. My native name is. Usantaneze, which means one who walks amongst the dreams. So be careful. I might appear in your dreams. <laughs> so, Saiku Cook is an architect, urban designer, researcher, and curator. Born in Jamaica and based in Charlotte, North Carolina, he is the director of the Master of Urban Design program at UNC Charlotte. The 2021-22 Nizer Jones Hip Hop Fellow at the Hodgkins Center for African and African American Research at Harvard University, and the founding member of the Black Reconstruction Collective. Cook is a leading advocate for the study and practice of hip hop architecture, which addresses the broad impacts of the racist history of architecture and urban planning, opening a pathway for practice, education, scholarship that embraces architecture as a tool for shaping, reflecting, and understanding culture. As an architectural and urban design practice, Seiko Cook Studio is grounded in research emphasizing both the broader cultural, contextual, and improvisional uh, potential of projects. The work of the studio is centered on the exploration of hip hop architecture an approach to contemporary design and embraces hip hop culture and applies its shape, structure, and ideologies to the built environment. The studio completed design commissions for master plans, multi-unit residential development, developments, residential and commercial buildings, interior renovations, speculative developments, and uh, talent improvement across the United States and internationally. Key recent projects include the forthcoming Syracuse Hip, Syracuse Hip Hop Port, um, Headquarters, Design for Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety Standards Plan, the APADU program, the Grits and uh, Griots, an architectural intervention commission for the 21 architectural, uh, Chicago Architectural Biennale. Cook's research practice center on the emerging field of hip hop architecture, a theoretical movement reflecting the core talents, tenets in, of hip hop culture with the power of creating meaningful impacts on the built environment and gives voice to the 
marginalized and unrepresented in, within design practice. His work has been explored through the, his writings, exhibitions, lectures, and symposia. It is the subject of uh, monograph, hip hop architecture, published in 2021 and in the 2018 exhibition Cook curated Close to the Edge, the Birth of Hip Hop Architecture, which was first mounted in the 2018 at the AIA Center for Architecture in, in New York. And I kind of remember that actually. Now that I, uh, I that was mentioned, the um, this ex exhibition is currently traveling to uh, venues across the U.S. His work uh, was also featured in the landmark exhibition "Reconstructions: Architecture and Blackness in America" at the Museum of Modern Art in the spring of 2021. The studio has received widespread recognition for his design work, including the 2022 Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League of New York. Other design awards include honorary mention at the Faculty of Design Contemporary 2021 C ACCA Awards for Close to the Edge, receiving a commendation for the Government of Jamaica, the GOJ, House of Parliament International Design Competition, placing as the finalist in the Reimagined Place AIA Central Park New York Design. Siko holds a B, a Bachelor of Architecture for Cornell University, an MArc from Harvard University, and is a licensed practitioner, practitioner architecture, architect in New York and North Carolina. Please help me welcome Seiko Cook. Thanks, James. I appreciate that um, introduction. Um, and uh, thanks also to Dave for the invitation and to everyone at the Media Architecture Biennale for having me here. Um, I was talking to a few people last night and saying that um, I don't really have an idea what I'm gonna talk about today because uh, I've been here for a few days and most of my time hasn't really been familiarizing myself with the city. I'm pretty familiar with Toronto because um, I used to live in Syracuse, New York. And it's just just across the lake, it's just a four hour drive. Um, but uh, I have been trying to find out a little bit more about how my work intersects with a lot of the work that's been happening here and that people talk about um, under the envelope or under the umbrella of media architecture. Um, so uh, I'm, I've put a few things together here under this title, and uh, I'm hoping that um, some of it might be either relevant or at least uh, allow for um, a different way of, of, of thinking about um, what you do. Uh, and maybe just as the things that I've seen this last couple of days have made me think a little bit differently about the things that I do. Um, and that's, that's what all this usually is about, right? The academic space is a space of, of discourse. And I tell my students that discourse just means talking, just means conversation. So as long as there's information being, being exchanged one way or another, then we're, we're in the right space. Um, but I will first talk about hip hop architecture because this is a term that uh, people um, usually open their eyes a little bit larger when they when they hear it, um, and they try to, and then all these different ideas get sparked in their head about what it might be, um, and then they get really frustrated when I when I don't define it in the way that they want me to define it. Um, it's it's um, it's not a specific style of architecture like like the Baroque or modernism. It's, it's much more of a movement that has to do with attitudes and specific um, ways of thinking and processes that, that connect to a larger culture of hip hop. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and I've also packed a, um, quite a bit in here, so hopefully um, we'll, the way we navigate through it will start to land in, in a way that we can all appreciate. Um, First off, um, I'll start with this quote from Carol Walker, 
And some of you may know she's a, a visual artist, um, very powerful black female artist who um, has a lot of transformational theories and practices. Um, and she wrote this in um, as part of this, um, this exhibition that she had curated in 2014 called Roughneck Constructivist. Um, and it was referred to me after I wrote my first piece on hip hop architecture. Um, and I was really heartened to see that she was looking for this movement, um, a theory of architecture that was based in this uh, hip hop roughneck rude boy ethos. Um, and, and mind you, the show was a show about a visual artist, but she was looking for a theory of architecture. Um, so it made me feel like I was probably on the right track when thinking about hip hop architecture, that it might be that, that same uh, movement that she was in, or that theory that she was in search of. Um, so from 2014, when I wrote my first piece, through the exhibition in 2018, that all that work over um, about eight years, or seven or eight years, culminated in the book, um, uh, Hip Hop Architecture, uh, the monograph that was uh, a culmination of all that work that I'd been doing. Um, and it's more of a curatorial work, even though there's quite a lot of theory in there. Um, it's, it's collecting uh, uh, evidence of a movement that has been around since the, the early 1990s when people were first trying to bring their own hip hop cultural identity into their architectural studio work. Um, the book is broken down into four different volumes. Uh, these volumes are thought of kind of like different tracks on, in, um, I mean, it's, 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 it's formatted like a vinyl or like a CD. I'm, I'm kind of from the CD era. Um, and each volume is broken down into a uh, collection of these different essays, uh, each one about 1,000 to 2,000 words that are on these basic, diff basic topics. The first volume is a kind of general introduction to the ideas around hip hop architecture, um, an introduction to the book, an introduction to me as a voice of this, this, this theory, this movement. Um, so it starts out with a, a disclaimer before the manifesto and a disclaimer starts out with the line, this book is not for you. Um, a, a very, uh, you know, it, it was quite a risky line to put in the, at the beginning of the book. Um, once my publishers said it was okay, then I thought it was, you know, worth the risk. Um, but it was really to, to step outside of this um, academic elitist space that was expecting you to constantly validate yourself and your culture within a system that they had set up. Um, and I was very much saying that this is not about getting that validation. It's really about connecting with people who have this cultural philosophy within them that they want to express within their work, but they've been historically shut down within um, these academic circles. Um, the, I end the, the, the disclaimer by, by saying that um, I'm not a hip hop architect. Um, and I'm not even a black architect, I, I'm an architect. Um, so uh, that is how I primarily identify as an architect, um, not a media architect, um, I just, uh, which, which, which for me means that I take on all of the, the shortcomings that, that being an architect means, but um, uh, aspire to a broader, more inclusive understanding of what that term can, 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 can um, expand to be. So the second volume is where all the heavy theory is. This is where I'm referencing people like Kara Walker and uh, um, uh, Craig Wilkins and uh, Mabel Wilson. Um, so a lot of really amazing theorists on architecture, on blackness, on hip hop, uh, like Maury Foreman. Um, and it's broken down into a lot of these. It seemed like a really good idea for me to have two things in my hand when I started this, but maybe, maybe not. Um, okay, different kind of choreography than I'm used to. Um, so, no, nope. this way. There we go. Okay. So um, I take on some of the the ideas of race and gender really, really um, head on right at the beginning. Uh, but it's also uh, an area where we start to define what hip-hop architecture 
means for different people in different ways from a theoretical standpoint. Uh, so um, the, the most easy user, user friendly um, Reader's Digest version of that is that hip hop architecture is um, hip hop culture in built form. So that means that we need a, an understanding, a basic understanding of what hip hop culture is first before we can understand how to build it. And that it's hip hop culture isn't just um, a genre of music, it's a cultural phenomenon that's 50 years old now, believe it or not, um, celebrating its, its official, unofficial 50th anniversary um, on um, October 23rd um, of this year. And uh, it, it has multiple facets, multiple um, tenets. So b-boying, emceeing, graffiti, and breakdancing are the four primary elements, but it go, gets into language and fashion. Basically, um, everyone um, who's tapped into contemporary culture in any way or form is affected by hip hop culture, right? Um, whether you like it or not. Um, and then we have to un also understand what architecture is, that ideally architecture is about people. It's not about construction material, it's not about technology, it's not about um, uh, theories of space, it's not about sociology, it's about people. How do people live and breathe and how do we interact with our surroundings through our specific cultural lenses? And if the dominant cultural lens that we we approach the world with is, is um, in this moment in time, uh, connected to hip hop culture, then we need to understand architecture through those same lenses. The third volume of the book is where we get into all the pretty pictures. This is where we actually start to say, uh, try to understand um, what does this all look like, right? And this is what you're all thinking. What does it look like? Um, how do we see a hip hop building? What is, um, how do I go into a hip hop space? Um, and really, this is uh, presenting multiple ways or multiple forms or multiple test cases that people have done over 25 years to try to answer that same question. Um, and at the end of this, I don't actually answer that because for me, it doesn't look like any one thing. It looks like multiple things. So the first step on this was the exhibition that, that uh, James alluded to, the one that started in 2018 called Close to the Edge, The Birth of Hip Hop Architecture, where I brought together uh, work from about 30 different practitioners representing seven different countries and 25 years. Um, and all of this work was, uh, was exhibited at the Center for Architecture in 2018 at first. Um, and then it's been traveling since then to uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, to Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, most recently, it was at MoDA, the Museum of Design Atlanta in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, actually, tomorrow morning, I'm getting on a plane to fly to Los Angeles for the, for the LA opening of this show, which I promise will be the final edition of this exhibition. Um, uh, doesn't make a whole lot of people happy, but it makes me happy. Um, so, um, and in, in the show and in the book, I start to talk about works from people like Olalekan Jefus, who's uh, trained as an architect at Cornell University and now practices as a visual artist, actually had one of the, the most amazing um, pieces at the most recent Venice Biennale. He just won the, the, um, the Silver Lion for the Young, Young Designers Award. Um, uh, really good friend of mine, we, we went to Cornell together, but he, he sees the world through a different kind of a lens that's directly influenced by his connection with hip hop culture, right? Um, and this project is a machine for creating graffiti on, a, on the surfaces of uh, uh, derelict buildings. Um, it also includes work from Nathan Williams, who is we call the, the godfather of hip hop architecture. Um, this is his, his Bachelor of Architecture thesis work that's been redone, but the original work was done in 1993. So this was before anybody else had really talked about or, th or thought about hip hop architecture. 
Uh, Craig Wilkins was doing some work in, uh, at the same time, but in Chicago, not connected to this, um, around hip hop architecture. And um, this thesis project won the thesis prize at Cornell for that year and really just blew everyone away and influenced a whole generation of black and brown students at Cornell who were, like me, who were coming up and thinking about how we could express our own cultural identity through our work. Um, it also includes work from my own students, um, and I've taught a few different studios on hip hop architecture, like this one in Chicago that I did in um, 2018, um, or this one in Washington DC that I did in 2016, uh, where students are starting to understand the diagrammatic qualities of a city through the lens of hip hop. Um, and to work that's even more contemporary, uh, this is a 2019 uh, Master of Architecture thesis project. Um, and the difference between uh, this work and um, Nathan Williams' work from, from 1992 or 1993 is that he had precedence. Now there was theory, there was writing. Um, this is why the book was written. This is why all this work is being done for students who want to produce work like this and want to have a theoretical underpinning so that their professors don't, don't dismiss them as, as, as doing something that um, isn't really academically sound. Um, we've also found work from other people uh, you know, in different areas of the world. This is work, work in Paris by Stéphane Mal Malka. This is someone who used to be uh, a graffiti artist and then became an architect. Now he practices in, in, uh, internationally in LA and London and, and Paris. Um, and then work by Delta, the, the very famous graffiti artist who started in the mid 80s um, as a 2D graffiti artist, but then for the last 10 to 15 years, he's um, broken that two dimensional plane and started to make things that are now more habitable. Um, and then I include work from people like Theaster Gates. Um, I, I was just talking to someone outside about Theaster. Um, and he obviously, he's someone who's trained as a ceramicist. His, his dad was a roofer and he's in the art world, but he's created multiple buildings and structures from these um, sampled, collaged pieces of, of building detritus to, to create these spaces, temporary spaces like this, or more permanent spaces in, on the south side of Chicago. Um, this space was in Bristol, Connecticut, in Brist Bristol in the UK. Um, and then work by uh, more contemporary architects like sports. And this is an alleyway in Chattanooga, Tennessee that is influenced by the graffiti that was already there and then created this one line, the single line um, installation called City Thread. The fourth volume of the book is where we go into things that are tangentially connected to um, hip hop architecture. So other architectural movements that um, may ha bear some kind of resemblance to hip hop architecture in one way or another, but aren't explicitly about hip hop. Um, so like Afrofuturism or activist architecture or um, deconstructivism. And of course, Kanye gets his own chapter, right? Um, uh, to match the size of his ego. Um, he, uh, you know, so he's someone who was kind of at, at the, 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 the beginning of my own uh, entree into starting to write about this when he was planning, when, we were, when he was talking about architecture and I wrote a piece talk, uh, expressing how important it was for popular people like him in the world to be talking about architecture because then architecture becomes something cool. Then now this, this problem of underrepresentation within architecture becomes something that we can, we can um, uh, confront more, more head on um, with, with, with voices like his. Um, unfortunately, he's not somebody that we can follow that clearly all the time. Um, but we, you know, uh, Afrofuturism is something that still doesn't have a very clear architectural look, but um, the show in, at MoMA um, uh, by Bodis uh, Isaac Kingeles um, did some work in that regard. Um, other work, like um, in, in, in informal ways, informal settlements, this project by um, uh, Aravena um, called Half a House, where they just build 
half of the house and allow the other half to be filled in in informal ways by, um, by the tenants is really quite fascinating and fits quite um, well in with some of the theories that we're proposing. And then work from people that I'm calling um, neo-postmodernists who use a lot of the, the ideas and, and um, imagery of the postmodernists but use very contemporary tools. So this is work by uh, Jennifer Bonner at Mall. Um, this project called um, uh, Better Sandwiches. Um, so there's another area that I thought might, might connect quite well with some of the work that you all are doing um, at this conference um, in, in the area of technology. And um, technology in, in hip hop terms is, is um, not as direct as uh, in most areas. Um, I'm much, I've been diving a little bit deeper in this area of the general topic of hip hop architecture because I, there's something fascinating about how hip hop as a culture um, addresses uh, technology or engages with technology. So this quote from Harry Allen talks about how hip hop um, makes, makes technology tactile. It makes it do things it wasn't supposed to do. And that started with the first time um, with, with the hip hop DJ, right? We can think about the hip hop DJs as the original hackers of technology. Um, and they started by doing the first thing, the one thing that your mother told you never to do with a record, which is touch, putting your fingers on, on the face of it. Um, and that singular act transformed the phonograph from a passive consumption device into now an active musical instrument, right? Um, and something that may be analog in, in its, in its uh, inception um, still now has a much more human uh, interface. Um, and I think there's a lot more that we can do within digital technologies to add that humanistic value to it. Um, so this is some of the work that I'm starting to think a little bit more deeply about. Um, of course, uh, the legendary um, uh, Jay Dilla, um, rest in peace, uh, was one of the main, um, one of the main uh, proponents of this. He transformed technology um, in, in a far different way than anybody could have conceived of. His production catalog is, is amazing. Um, I love this photograph because you see all the different uh, uh, pieces that he's working with, the drum machines, the keyboards, even the background, you see one of these old school iPods. Um, I don't know if some of the younger people recognize what that is or know what that thing is. Um, but I'm gonna play a short video that talks a little bit about, about Jay Dilla. I was going to play that. The drum machine by avoiding certain things that he could have done to make it more robotic, make it more stiff. For instance, the MPC has this incredibly useful tool called quantization. What quantizing does is it takes your performance. Let's say I'm playing my drum pattern. And when I'm playing it, sometimes it's a little ahead, it's a little bit behind. If your kick drums are off by a little bit, quantization snaps them in place. And so a lot of producers, they use quantize, not as a crutch, but just, they just weren't thinking about not using it. And so Dilla was like, yeah, I'm just gonna turn this off. The result is a discography full of incredibly off-kilter drums. So that in and of itself, taking something that, that um, digital producers have decided to fix the human error and then turning it off to make it more human is an attitude that is completely different than anything we find in um, contemporary technology. And, but it's just a, a, a basic attribute of, of hip hop culture itself. Um, another uh, piece of writing that I use to, to influence my own thinking on hip hop technology is this piece by Amiri Baraka. And he was writing this in the 60s, but he writes it like someone text messages today. Um, this, is, this is literally um, um, directly from, from the text, but he's talking about a typewriter and as a, as a piece of technology, a piece of machinery 
that we approach in a very, very different way. Um, he's talking about something that if he were to invent an, inscri uh, um, an expression scriber, he wouldn't use just the, the tips of his fingers, but he would use elbows, feet, head, behind, and it would make all these different sounds. Um, it would make screams, grunts, taps, itches. So he's thinking about a, a machine that would, com would, would create a completely different level of communication. Um, and in the end, he's just said, he says a typewriter is corny, right? Because it can't really express any of those, those essential attributes of humanness. So uh, this takes me to the, this, this one bit of research project that I did called 3D Turntables. And there's been a few different iterations of it more recently, but I'm going to show you the, the first version of it that I started back in 2017. Um, we started with these really cheap 3D printers uh, that are becoming, you know, 3D printing is, is, is quite commonplace in architectural fabrication these days. But these ones were great to work with. They were $200. We bought five of them so we could break them and do all kinds of weird shit with them. Um, but we started out with this, uh, this really printing a, 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 a very simple primitive, um, a, a two inch by two inch cube. And then um, decided if you, what would happen if we disrupted that primitive as it was being printed from up the bed. So si similarly to the finger being put on the record, we're going to put our finger on the on the print bed, or we might put it on the on the nozzle as it's printing. So we'd get things like this or like this when we're printing it out um, from the the same the same primitive. We also would hack the, the, the software input, so where it has the idea where it can actually print uh, a, um, uh, a fill, and so the fill is for the structural support of this, this cube, and then there's a shell that it also prints, um, and so this is what happens when we print them separately with the fill only or the shell only and disrupt it at the same time. And each time we're not changing the input. The input is exactly the same each time, but it's presenting this complete variety of outputs. Uh, the second thing we did was 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 we experimented with 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 spinning. What could we? How could we add rotation? Now we have to create a new uh, print bed on top of the existing print bed, um, and then we started to get um, do things like this, where we would rotate that rotate the bed um, at intermittent points along the printing, and then we'd start getting um, products like this or like this. Um, and then the third one was uh, what we called the uh, crossfade, and that's supposed to be emulating, taking a record from one side to the other side. Um, and uh, this is what the studio looked like for um, uh, about two or three months during that my summer. Um, but what we did was, again, with that same removable print bed, we printed one level of, of a primitive at the same time and then swapped them out uh, at, at, at a certain interval and then continued the prints. So we'd start to get prints that look like this. And we had had to change the primitive because we couldn't start with the cube. Now we had to have a, something that's slightly different from a cube. And it would get these types of um, outputs. Um, and of course, because I'm an architect, we have to draw everything. And um, so we drew uh, the documentation of all of that and um, created a matrix of possible outcomes of, of what that would mean. Um, and then we started to see how can we apply this to the built environment in a more direct way. We thought of various, various ways, but we started first, the, the, the easiest point of entry was thinking about uh, a house. And in this case, we were thinking about um, uh, a couple of derelict houses in, in Syracuse, New York, on the south side, an area that's, that's going through a lot of um, disinvestment and empty lots and um, buildings slated for demolition. So these two buildings were right across from uh, a building that I had just completed in, in, um, in 2013, 2014. Um, and we put it through the same process. So the house now becomes a primitive and the house then gets shifted and turned and jarred 
And because the house has orientation, now you're not just rotating it in one direction, you're rotating it in, in three different axes, the x, y, the x, z, and the z, x, um, or the z, y, sorry. Um, and so now the matrix of different possibilities starts to expand a bit more, starts to look like this. Um, and then we came up with this as a, uh, as a prototype for how to imagine um, the demolition of a house as something that is, um, is active. It's, it's, it's a performance on the, in the public realm. And it, it's something that also starts to reveal histories of, of what might have been lost in, in the neighborhood. So each of these share planes becomes a, a surface for revealing a new image uh, of, of the past, of the history. Um, and this work started to be um, likened to um, some of the work by Gordon Matta Clark. Um, again, someone trained as an arch architect but practiced as an artist. Uh, I've always been fascinated with his work, but it I came full circle back around to it. Um, and then some of these other visualizations by photographers who are using collage as this technique, um, like uh, Philippe Dujardin or um, Xavier Del Delory. And interestingly enough, um, in walking around yesterday, um, I, I, I've started to, and I was talking about this a little bit last night, I've started to, to identify a new typology that's emerging within Toronto as a landscape, this, this new hybridized um, uh, building, um, which is this existing building that is being preserved and then a new tower up on top of it. So this is a photograph that I took from one of these um, uh, uh, signboards uh, of, of a construction site. So this is the tower that they're building, and you can see this this um, this uh, uh, this this um, colonialist uh, building that's below it. That they're both happening at the same time, and even under construction, this building under construction is like the the ultimate collage. So uh, some of these ideas that we're that that I'm provoking aren't that far off from things that we're already doing in, in, in society today. We're just not calling it the same thing, right? Um, so next, I'll talk a little bit about um, this project um, that I did uh, for the Museum of um, Modern Art. This was a, a commissioned piece um, for the, the exhibition called Reconstructions. Uh, architecture and Blackness in America. Um, and it was, this is the publication that came out of that, that exhibition. Um, and it's, it's, it's a show that was really, um, uh, well, in one sense, it was part of a lineage of other shows in the, for the architecture and design um, uh, department at MoMA. Um, uh, connected to some of these other titles that may be, uh, all, all, may also be familiar, um, Rising Currents, Foreclosed, and Uneven Growth. Um, there's a, a much more politically charged sense of this show than these, these previous shows, um, uh, also reflected in how we were treated. Uh, um, uh, our show was only open for three months when all these others were open for six months. Um, but that's just one microcosm of a larger uh, um, um, dystopian <laughs> reality of that, that whole exhibition. Um, it was curated by uh, Sean Anderson, who was at MoMA at the time, and Mabel Wilson, who's a professor of architecture at, at, at Columbia. Um, and they invited 10 um, practicing uh, architect, or. 10 architects and designers. Um, everyone here has an architectural background. Not everyone is practicing as an architect. Um, as I was saying, um, Ola Lekon Jafis here and Amanda Williams, both trained as architects but now practicing as visual uh, artists. Um, and then uh, Walter Hood, very famous landscape architect, also trained as an architect. Um, so 10 of us were invited to, um, to, to to produce work based on um, independent commissions to think about a city within the US um, through the lens of blackness and understand uh, what, what um, architectures might start to come out of that. Um, and I'll play the quick promo video of that first. 
really hard for brown and black people to imagine a future in this country. It's been a real challenge because black people in America are not given the space to even just be. In order then to think about possible futures, somehow we have to reimagine ourselves in new places and then find ways to get there. We're not just interrogating America's history with blackness. We're interrogating architecture's history with blackness. So to interrogate architecture's history with blackness, um, so eloquently put, um, I uh, started with, uh, looked at Syracuse, New York. Um, it was a likely candidate for me because I'd been living in Syracuse, New York. Um, I ended up, I was there for almost 10 years. Um, so about eight years at the time. And um, uh, Syracuse was not on the original list. They gave us a list of 10 cities. Syracuse was not on the original list. But I, I argued for it because it's, it's um, uh, the story of Syracuse is the story of blackness and architecture in the US. Um, so we start out with uh, an area like this called the 15th Ward, an area of, of, of dense black population, thriving black businesses in the mid 50, 40s and 50s, um, and uh, lots of um, store ownership, biz, uh, businesses, commerce, um, housing, um, and then that gets um, called uh, a slum, and then this is the result of urban renewal, right? So the, the highway comes right through the middle of it. Um, this is right through the middle of the city, and um, then we get a, a situation that looks kind of like this, um, and this is where the heart of the 15th Ward used to be. Um, uh, right up here in the top left corner, which used to be, which is now the Civic Center. There's a beautiful museum by, um, by uh, um, um, the, it's the Everson Museum by I am Pei. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, and the the residences for the for the medical um, for the medical schools. There's three medical universities up here in the top right. Um, and then in the foreground is the, um, the, the, the low income or, or uh, public housing projects. This one called Pioneer Homes was built in 1938, one of the oldest um, public housing projects built uh, after slum clearance, so uh, just slightly preceding uh, urban renewal but having the same effects. And then of course in the 1950s or 1965, then they build the highway right through the middle of it. So the, the, the highway literally bifurcates the, the housing project and people have to, to live there. Um, so what's happening now is that for the last um, 10 years or so, more than 10 years they've been talking about, um, they've condemned this, this elevated stretch of, of I-81 um, it has to come down, that elevated viaduct, um, um, by federal mandate. Um, and so they said that they had to do one of two things. Either they have to tear it down and rebuild it better and bigger and faster, or um, they would tear it down and transform this into what they're calling the, the community grid. So they turn it into a boulevard, there's no more elevated highway, and they reroute um, traffic around the city, like most other civilized cities, having the highway going around it instead of right through the center of it. Um, believe it or not, that's something that's been, um, even though they, they asked for it to be done um, and it got full approval to be done over five years ago, it's still um, not yet finalized. There's still figuring out how to, how to finalize all the pieces. And there's a huge protest and a huge pushback against tearing down um, the, the same highway that um, has caused all this disruption 60 years ago. Um, so they're, they're really in danger of doing the, the, um, 
making the same mistakes again. Um, so even assuming that the, 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 the viaduct is coming down, um, there is now this effort to say, um, by the Syracuse Housing Authority primarily, that owns most of the land uh, that this public housing is on, um, how do we redevelop this area? Um, and they brought in this developer called uh, Purpose Built Communities um, and to look at the entire area and come up with a development plan and there's already RFPs out and they're awarding contracts right now for developers of this land. The, the trouble is that one, they are, they've decided that um, this is gonna be mixed income housing instead of low income housing which means that uh, only a small percentage of it is gonna be affordable to low-income families. Um, the, the number of units is moving from, um, uh, from 1,400 down to 1,200 units, so less units, um, less percentage. Um, they also cite Atlanta's East Lake community as a prime example of the success of purpose-built communities. Um, in that case, only about 20% of the people who were displaced were able to return to that, to that neighborhood. So um, uh, anything coming close to 25% return is seen as a success. Um, and uh, before doing this project and since doing this project, uh, there's one question that nobody's been able to answer for me, like, which is where are the people who are being displaced going to go? No one has answered that question for me as yet sufficiently. Um, there's a lot of talk about vouchers, about they're, they're having choice to live wherever they want, but if there's no affordable housing, there really is no choice. Um, so I set my project up as a kind of preemptive critique of what they're gonna be doing in this area. Um, and I've been guided by a couple, a couple quotes um, more than just a couple quotes, but these, are, these two stand out more than others. This one from Catherine McKittrick, who basically talks about the history of black people in the US is um, of being placed and displaced, continually placed and displaced, which means that black people in America have never been able to decide where they live. Um, it's either this is where we'll tolerate you, or if that becomes now valuable, we'll move you to somewhere else. Uh, and then you, that's where you can live. Um, the next quote is from The Wire. If you, if you watch The Wire, this is season three, episode one. Um, this is where uh, they're tearing down the, 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 the housing project where they used to be selling drugs. Um, and, and this quote sums everything up that, you know, they, they'll, they'll tear it down, they'll build some new shit, but they don't really give a fuck about people. Um, and remember, architecture is about people. Uh, so we found, um, in our research, we also found some of these beautiful old drawings of the original pioneer homes. And if you look closer at these drawings, you start to see dotted, in dotted lines all of these houses that were removed when, when um, pioneer homes was being built, which was really fascinating for us to see um, in each of these drawings. Uh, also, um, the, 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 the one just across from Pioneer Homes, uh, McKinney Manor, uh, is a new public housing project built on top of the site of an old public housing project. So now you have the dotted line of the old housing project that, that got removed. And so it's like there's these, all these multiple layers of removal and erasure on the site that we were very fascinated by. Um, there's also this attitude um, the title of this project um, is, is, is uh, We Outcha, um, and it, it, it wanted to align itself with uh, a kind of attitude of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe connected to the trap, like trap music, where uh, thinking about a, a, a space that we decide that we're not gonna be removed from again. We're going to own this public space and, um, uh, and create um, a kind of face that is not as tolerable as one that could m more easily be moved. So um, all of that then led to some of these drawings which provided the base of what was shown in the exhibition. 
Um, this is uh, all of the layers of the houses that used to be there, the public housing that is there now, and a projection on the mixed income housing that's gonna be built later. So it's, it's you know, all of these white boxes are um, uh, a kind of formulaic projection on um, unit type, unit sizes, uh, four stories, um, extrusions. And then we overlap that and intersect that with some of the things that used to be there and are there now. And all these little orange buildings are where the current buildings and the past buildings intersect. And then where, the, where those intersect with the future buildings, then there is a subtraction. Um, so when we look at it three-dimensionally, this is what that landscape starts to look like. And it's imagining that there's a kind of new public realm that traces all the layers of history and also allows for a, a new kind of economy to emerge within these little follies that are represented in orange. Um, and then we also did a series of floor plans of those. Um, uh, and e e the floor plans themselves are collages, so they they're kind of not designed. Um, they're imagining, uh, again, uh, an algorithmic uh, building that's gonna be built and even collaged in some of some floor plans that came from uh, purpose-built communities uh, projects in Atlanta and then collaged in with the subtracted layers of what was um, what we had been working with. Then we came up with a couple other pieces uh, that were part of the, the nine square grid. Um, so this is a, a section showing the, the new and the old juxtaposed against each other, collaging the, this, 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 um, this presence of the highway through the public housing and then collaging um, the, the historic uh, photograph of the space. And then the final layer was then re, um, reprinting or actually screen printing. These are all hand screen prints of, of the drawings that we discovered from the Syracuse Housing Authority um, and put those on top of those drawings. And so this is what they, they look like um, framed and in, in the exhibition. Um, and then that we also produce these larger scale uh, renderings, more detailed renderings that um, talk about showing that, that, that public realm that is activated by these subtractions and intersections um, while um, showing the, the, the new proposed buildings as these ghosted, vast, um, almost empty um, uh, buildings that, that used to be there. And again, because I'm an architect, I, I draw a section elevation throughout the whole um, space. Um, and this was also exhibited in the show. Um, the last piece of the exhibition, there are three pieces, the nine square grid, the larger renderings, and then uh, a, a large scale um, model or, or construct um, that represented some of these overlaps and intersects. Um, and we started, Instead of um, building a new uh, casting of of, a, of steps, I actually sacrificed the steps of the back of off the back of my own house in Syracuse. So these are these um, really cheap prefab concrete steps uh, that we um, took off and chopped. We um, made this diagonal uh, cut through, um, then um, drag it all the way to the the shop at Syracuse University. Um, and then uh, built up this base to support it of plywood and had this other um, subtractions within that base to represent a kind of uh, mid-scale between the large one-to-one -one scale and the smaller scale of the model. And the model scale was represented by these smaller pieces that were 3D printed and laser cut and put on top of the, uh, on the top. And the last piece was this little concrete chunk that, um, was part of that middle scale. Um, and this is what it looked like as it came together. And this is it in the exhibition space on the wall. And again, we start to see um, some of these images of the historical uh, communities that used to be there, um, which is a theme that I've, I've been picking up on uh, quite a bit in, in, in my work. 
And, and this is a moment that I, I really enjoyed seeing. This is a couple days after it opened. And um, you know, the work was so accessible that people felt like sitting on it, touching it, stepping on it. Um, uh, pissed off the, the security guards, but, um, but I was like, no, no, I'm the artist. I'll, I'll allow it. It's OK. It's all good. Um, so, uh, but the, the, the fact that the work that I can do it at any scale is, 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 is relating to and connecting to people is, is quite important to me. Um, the, the, the last project I'll show um, is this one um, that I thought might, might be relevant to this audience is the project that I call Shock, the Syracuse Hip Hop Headquarters. Um, and uh, this is a building that uh, I've been working on since 2019. Um, we just, again, got a little bit more funding to do a little bit more design work on this um, that we're working on right now. And we're hoping that that's going to make it uh, fundable or palatable to a, to, a, um, to a developer to help uh, build it out. But um, yeah, I'll just play this video. Uh, it's about two minutes, and then I'll be done. Two Fifteen Tully, the Hip Hop Center for Youth Entrepreneurship, is not just a building for us to engage youth. It's deeper than that. This building is about identity. Imagine kids walking into a building that speaks to them, that has their culture, that they feel ownership of, and then it's also opportunity. It's those two things: this identity and purpose together. The, the vision was to create a space as we outgrew, so our programs were continuing to grow, we were starting to serve more youth, and it was like we needed a building that spoke to the approach that we were taking with kids. And so um, I was looking for buildings all over the city, and I happened to have a meeting in this area, and drove by the building and just slammed on my brakes, and I was like, this is it. When I think about Syracuse, and, and I'm, whenever I'm talking to people, I ask them, can you name a building in Syracuse or anything that speaks to the youth and the culture that they understand? And every single time, people go silent, right? There's nothing that embraces hip-hop. There's nothing that um, identifies with hip-hop. And so that's why we wanted to do this building. It almost becomes like a, a living museum. Graffiti is live. It's, it's living. That's what people have to understand is that this is an identity for people. People relate to this. I could not be who I am, um, and I cannot define myself without hip hop. I grew up in hip hop. But it's almost a, a, a kind of an ironic thing because they don't fully know about their culture. And so it's like with any culture, if, you, if the elders aren't teaching the youth about their culture, then it's going to be interpreted however society interprets it, right? And so we're trying to bring that back, that, that information and knowledge about the history, where it came from. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. That was insightful. That was uh, made reminded me very much of my community, indigenous communities, trying to uh, find a place, find representation in the built form. And uh, hip hop architecture is uh, is uh, you're further along than we are, and in the indigenous world. Um, and you've done some exciting projects. The, the th one that, that stuck out for me, and I really have a, more of a comment than anything, is the, the, the renderings and the, the drawings that you did and the, the models where you had voids in them. Um, as soon as I seen that and the overlaying of different, um, different eras and uh, the dotted lines, to me there was a responsibility there. It was showing this responsibility that is uh, somehow the hip hop culture is erasable and, uh, well not the, the black culture really, is, is erasable and, and, and can reconfigure at, at the whim of, of who's ever, you know, you know in state politics. Um, and so that, that sense of responsibility, um, you, you somehow was able to capture that in, in drawing form, I mean, um, 
Uh, what was that project like? Uh, yeah, the, there's um, the the idea of of uh, understanding erasure and fighting against erasure is is key to the work that I'm doing now and to that piece and also to to hip hop architecture in general. Um, uh, Craig Wilson. Craig Wilkins writes about um, uh, four basic ways that hip hop architecture needs to perform. It, it needs to be um, anthropomorphic, means it needs to be about the body, it needs to be uh, palimpsestic, so it needs to understand these layers of erasure. It needs to be uh, adaptive, um, so it can adapt to any different um, situation. And it needs to be performative, so it needs to also be uh, in, in, in participation with an active uh, populace, right? Um, so for, for that project and for some projects that I'm working on now, there's this, there's this um, deep understanding that there's always something that was there before, mm -hmm. right? We, we never start um, with a tabla rasa, a, a blank slate, right? Um, it's, and that's really connected to this colonialist mindset. Like Absolutely. the idea of discovery is a colonialist idea that um, there's nothing before, right? Or no one had ever thought about something. Um, and hip hop understands that there's always something there. There's always a context. You always start with a sample. You always start with a break. You always start with some other influence um, that was there before. And for me, that's directly translated in um, understanding all these layers of history that would have existed in a site. Um, um, in any project I do now, that's, that's something that, that comes out um, quite, quite realistically. I think it's really well done. It, it really reminds me of the work that's ahead of us for indigenous architects in the country. Out of a cohort of 10,000 architects in the country, there's probably 20 registered indigenous architects, so we're behind the game. But I. Uh, I, I look at your work as great encouragement. That really, um, anyways, I, I uh, need to open this up. Or I could spend all afternoon here. I feel like Do uh, Phil Donahue. You all remember Phil Donahue? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we'll bring the mic around and uh, please. Uh, uh, this was absolutely uh, really, uh, really inspiring stuff. I, I, um, yes. Thank you very much for such an illuminating discussion. Um, on, a, on a very, uh, you know, you mentioned that the lack of people-centric approach in architecture and how you built your whole discourse on that. So would you um, like to mention where this is stemming from, especially in architecture and this kind of arrogance in architectural discourse? Thank you. Um. I don't. I don't know where it comes from. To be honest, um, I um, I was in architecture school in the '90s, um, and at that time, there was a deep, uh, a clearly documented deep uh, effort to remove culture from architecture, to remove identity and politics from architecture and think of architecture as, as, as a, some kind of apolitical act. Um, and I remember um, uh, a lecture about five or six years ago um, uh, about the, uh, the Architecture Institute in New York and, you know, like uh, Peter Eisenman and all of these, uh, um, like the, the whites and the grays and all those uh, postmodernists and what they were talking about. And, and they were literally talking about architecture as being apolitical. And um, you know, at least in the last three years, we understand that it's anything but, right? Like architecture is one of the primary tools of colonialist um, uh, uh, authorities, right? Um, and what we've done as a profession is we've become complicit with all of it um, instead of uh, arguing against it. Um, and, and I don't know where that comes from. I think it comes from some kind of um, self-deprecating attitude that that you know we like uh, we don't value our what we do or work or services as highly enough, or we're just happy to do to 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 be participating in 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 one way or another, or um, or maybe it just comes from this 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 primary 
genesis of, of the, our modern architectural profession, which started as a pastime for wealthy white males, right? Um, so if that's your attitude, then um, why bother think about people? You're just gonna think about your own self-expression and, um, and then you'll ha you know, talk at your dinner parties about how you know, beautiful this last creation is that you came up with. Um, not thinking about the, its impacts that it might have on the individual or the collective. So um, uh, I, I, it's hard for me to know exactly or put my head in, the, in that type of uh, thinking to, to create that way of, of being in the world. But, um, but all my work is, is really trying to undo that cycle. I love how you're creating now, well now uh, precedents yep. for younger uh, black architects to look at real precedents with real, uh, with real theory and real research. You know, one of the things that, um, th as you were doing your presentation, reminded me of how indigenous architecture is trying to capture the metaphysics. Mm -hmm. We're trying to create our own vocabulary for something that doesn't have a vocabulary. And in that creation of the vocabulary are these incredible intersections in findings mm -hmm. of these uh, new physical um, forms coming from the metaphysical. And, um, and it's that capturing, right? It's that giving a vocabulary to the uh, many systems, actually, in ways where there wasn't before a vocabulary. Um, I, anyways, I just, I, yeah. This is the type of stuff I write about, too, and I find it so fascinating because. I think that this is where sort of architecture lacks uh, some knowledge and insight, so. But I mean, well, well forgive me for, for stepping into areas that I'm not fully <laughs> versed in. Um, it seems like um, the effort for um, indigenous architects or indigenous peoples to, to, to come up with that vocabulary is, is somewhat trying to translate it into a language that's not their own, right? Um, but there, there already is a language that, that is spoken. And I was so fascinated yesterday hearing um, Susan talk about um, uh, a language that's 80% verbs. Um, and that you, know, you don't see things as nouns. You don't see things as, as, as owned or ownable or, 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 or fixed. They're always changing and evolving. And so there's a, a, already a mindset, a worldview, a language that goes along with that. And, um, and I think that's where I would start, especially, and that's what fascinates me about, about hip hop, that there is um, um, a, a language um, that's a, a physical spoken language, but it's a performed language, it's a lived language that um, we can all learn from and interpret in, in multiple ways um, that can, once we understand it, then we can produce architecture from it more, more clearly. Questions? Yes, Paul. Um, I love the, the music connection to the architecture. It's like, uh, um, it's some, so beautiful. I also wondered though, um, how the physicality of like breakdancing influences you and the way you think about space. Yeah, so um, the, this is part of what I, um, I, I try to break down at the beginning of, of uh, each of the conversations about hip hop architecture, that it's, it's um, you know, music, and rapping more specifically has become the kind of showpiece of hip hop culture. And it's, it's had the broadest impacts and influence and um, it's the most uh, recognizable um, element of the original four elements. Um, but before the MC was the DJ, right? And, and the, um, the DJ was uh, understanding the structure of music, um, not just as a, um, a passive thing, but that music became a landscape for action, mm -hmm. right? Now it's, it's a construct that I can work on and dismantle and remix and rethink. Um, and 
that became a conversation between the DJ and the b-boy, that was the, the, the primary battery of hip hop culture. The DJ communicating with the b-boy. Like what can I spin, how can I spin these records in a way to keep the b-boys dancing as long on the dance floor as possible, right? And then the MC was the master of ceremonies, the one who was conducting everything and then was the third, the third player that came on the scene. And of course, now they became the most prominent ones. So um, uh, in the book, uh, I break down all of the different, all the four primary elements and talk about how they relate to, um, to architectural language or architectural production. Um, and I start with the, um, these four kind of triads of, uh, of um, uh, uh, let's see if I can remember them. Um, uh, um, remixes renovation connected to the DJ. Um, uh, rap is uh, rap is construction, right? Um, uh, Breakdance is form and uh, graffiti is surface, right? So we can start to understand each of these different elements um, in their architectural equivalents so that um, the, the break dancer is, is really um, a distortion of what we think of as, as, as typical form. Like, you know, structurally, this is what we need to stand and to walk and to run. But the, the, the B-boy is, is really turning that, literally turning it on its head and, um, and um, imagining different forms and different tempos and different spatialities of that structure. Um, and, and then they take over space in a very, very different way. So they, they have a very different attitude towards public space. And, and they were originally performing or using empty lots or leftover spaces or subway platforms or... Um, even today in New York City, you can see um, little b-boy crews clearing out a space on a subway platform or a subway interchange and, and um, performing in that way. Uh, yeah, so, I, and I talk a lot about that in the book and, and, and how that we can learn from that or, or expand on that as architects. Down here, or this one up here, one down here. There and there. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Um, so my question is about, we're obviously living in a really turbulent political climate right now. And you think about hip hop, what it did through the music is it brought awareness to a lot of issues, right? And, and that really has changed, at least in the youth, how we see the world. I'm wondering through hip hop architecture, how can we remix how architecture and space and the built environment is viewed? How can we bring awareness through the spaces we live in, similar to your project? So that would be my question. Sure. Thanks. Um, so there, there are two chapters um, or sections or tracks um, at the beginning of the book that, that um, where I really start to get into this as much as I can. Uh, and they're called um, Legitimacy and Authenticity, right? And that's right at the beginning of the volume two. And that's important to me because um, legitimacy is something that's incredibly important in, in, in um, defining what hip hop actually is. And it's also incredibly important in understanding our relationship to it in architecture, right? Um, and what was fascinating about um, the pioneers of hip hop and what is anybody can can think of as quote unquote true hip hop um, is that it's incredibly authentic, right? They weren't really, uh, I mean, people like to, to talk about this narrative of how hip hop was revolutionary, hip hop was like fighting against um, oppression and it was somehow overcoming these oppressive forces, but it was really just, just a bunch of kids trying to have fun, right? They're literally high school kids figuring out how to have fun. But that rawness, that, that realness, that, that authenticity um, was unmis unmistakable. And it allowed a kind of freedom of expression and freedom of creation. And 
and we all know not all of it was 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 very um, palatable or tasteful. You know, a lot of it is is misogynistic and homophobic and and violent and um, but it's true, right? It's it's completely true and authentic. And um, when something, any kind of form, is allowed to be itself without worrying about the outside gaze um, or what it's how it's being perceived, then it can be revolutionary. And I think if architects figure out how to tap into that attitude, um, be fully authentically uh, an expression of, of itself without worrying about um, market-driven economies of, of, or of developers or um, worrying about government regulations or worrying about, um, you know, um, worrying about public perceptions of what it should be, then it can start to actually elicit the type of change that you're talking about. The other comment I wanted to make is these intersections between uh, some of your models, actually, and some of the drawings is that there was moments in there that were genuine, that were real, that, that only the discovery or overlay would produce those moments. And those are the, and that's the type of um, discovery, I guess, of some type of architectural vocabulary that is so needed. Um, and, and that's what it's so exciting is that, um, I mean, you've really created some some real precedents now for 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 the start. I mean, it's so it's still so new. Yeah. And um, you know, as underprivileged people, myself included, as an indigenous architect coming into the profession, um, I've had to find my way through language as well, using my language to create forms. And that was the whole idea doing this PhD work. When and I see a lot of this uh, groundwork really. That, that you've done, that it's mm -hmm. so exciting. I mean, uh, are, you, are you planning to write another book? Because um, you have a lot. <laughs> you have a yeah, so, well, well, before I answer that, <laughs> I'll say that, um, that uh, yeah, what, what, what makes it authentic is that it is about discovery, right? Mm -hmm. That it, it's, um, there is no preconceived notion of what, it, what it's gonna look like or what it is. Um, and I tell my clients that a lot, and you know, I, I have all kinds of different clients, but um, I, I tell them that any, if I know what something looks like before I start, then it's not a real design process. Mm -hmm. it, it has to be a discovery. I, I have to be able to go down a path, go down a journey, and that's the only way you get to some, at something really real, really authentic. Um, uh, I am planning on writing another book. Um, I, I do have, um, I have a, um, an agreement for a new book contract and, um, and a, a, a premise and a way and a method and it, and it should be pretty quick um, and pretty dynamic. Um, it's, 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 it's very different, um, maybe not so different, but different from the first one. Um, and I wasn't really sure, I mean, people have been asking me for, for a few years if I'm gonna write another book, and I'm like, I don't know, I don't think it's, it's ready. Um, because I don't really, I'm not interested in writing like Hip Hop Architecture 2, <laughs> Electric Boogaloo, you know, or, um, you know, the remix. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's really, um, the next title is gonna be much bigger and broader and actually talk to a, a whole different, not different, but wider audience. Um, and uh, um, I'll, I'll see how it goes. <laughs> more questions? One more. Yes, we have one yeah. up there. Thank you for your presentation. It was really wonderful and it made um, um, made me think through the process of, you know, how your method and your um, your design process is informed, right, by hip hop and 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 uh, other influences, and so um, so my question has to do with 
So you've shown us uh, the process, your design process and the thinking through of how um, you come to your designs and your proposals. And I'm wondering, um, I was curious to know more about what the implementation, right? So, um, so what happens through the process of trying to get these projects created, right? I'm sure there's a lot of um, negotiation and an, another kind of a whole other dance right, that happens <laughs> after that. And I wanted, if, I wondered if you can speak more about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for that question. Um, I, I tell people, I tell students this a lot, and I also tell people who are not um, in the industry how, about how just how slow architecture is. Um, it's a very, very slow process. Um, you know, it's no matter how big or small the project, it's it's almost impossible to to conceive of and complete a project in less than a year. Um, any impactful project takes multiple years. Um, if you're talking on the scale of urban design, then you're talking 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so, and but even longer is architectural ideas like. Theory in architecture takes a long time to take root, um, and um, you know this is something that, again, somebody started in 1993, 1992, 1993, and um, the world was just ready for it in the last few years, ready to accept it as something to 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 um, to experiment with. So. A lot of the work that I'm doing now is think is based on um, groundwork that I've 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 laid three or four years ago, and some of it is just now starting to come to life, and um, then it takes a while for it to then get built and then get um, and then get photographed, then get published then get evaluated. So it will might be another five to 10 years before anyone really know knows what any of these, uh, the, the larger impacts of any of these projects. But I can tell you about what I'm going through right now um, is uh, one, pro you know, the, the shock project I showed you, that's something that has been on and off for several years. and. Um, we've gotten really, really close on a lot of things, um, but obviously that's a really large project. It's going to be like ten million dollars to to construct. So, um, and we're only a fraction of the way there right now. Um, but we're we're very hopeful that we can do something very, very powerful and impactful there. Um, there's also um, uh, another project that I'm working on in Washington D.C. right now that I was thinking about showing, but I didn't think it was going to um, be right for this talk. Um, but that project is um, where really the, the, the DC Housing Authority has decided to take a lot of the ideas of hip hop architecture and hip hop urbanism very seriously. And we're doing a version of the, the, the Syracuse, um, the, the Weoucha project, the Reconstructions project in DC, so we're taking a, an existing low-income housing project um, that's slated for demolition, and we're gonna be chopping it up and instituting pieces and raising some of the history of what, what's there. And that as a process has been, um, we've been very fortunate from the administrative side for them to support our vision and our, our direction. Um, and we're working with the, the local community and getting them um, uh, kind of uh, oriented with the idea and getting them familiarized with what we're trying to do. That's been relatively slow as well because there's multiple rounds of talking to these, these user groups. Um, but we're at the point now where we're about to present the real vision for what that's supposed to be. And we're getting a little bit of pushback about, do you really want to chop these buildings up? Is that going to really be practical? Can we afford that? Like, what kind of work are we going to be doing? But, um, but I'm hopeful that that's going to keep going through. Um, there's another project that I didn't show, the standard plan ADU that we did for LA. Um, we have one person who's, who 
who purchased that standard plan who's going to uh, construct it. Um, that person happens to be the current CEO of Def Jam Records, and um, the it, you know it it should have started. Um, they should have broken ground like four months ago, five months ago, but then delays, delays, delays from all these other directions. Um, but we're hopeful that they'll start this month, maybe next month. Uh, and that will be something that will be kind of iconic and cool. Um, and then I also have another client that I just started working with who hired me to design a house, but it's actually not really a house. It's also... It's kind the best way to describe it, it's a, a, a Baha'i community hip hop urban farm center <laughs> house. <laughs> so we're having a lot of fun with it right now. You know, we're kind of taking and remixing samples of, ex, of, of prefabricated shelters and sheds and barns and stalls and seeing what that produces. And yeah, that's kind of fun. Don't know if that answered <laughs> what you're thinking about. But. Yeah, no, great, thank you. Um, I think you've really provided a way of thinking, like a blueprint for how to decolonize, right, the process of architecture that provides models for different ways of thinking through design. So thank you for that. Thank you. So in a way then, uh, your work is being recognized if you're asked to do a building like that. So that it's it's, it's um, happening somewhere, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, th they happen to be they happen to be uh, um, academics who have been studying that thing, for, you know, studying hip hop architecture for a while and and the ideas behind it, and thought that this was a good idea. But they also, you know, you know, obviously they're kind of wild and not not very typical. But um, we'll we'll see what comes out of it. The fact that um, you have that happening, you know, I, I would um, argue that uh, are they really that wild, or maybe they just seen some, some, some of the fruit of this work that really does make sense in the end, really. Yeah, I mean, it just takes it just takes a little bit of foresight. Mm -hmm. It takes a bit of, you know, you have to um, a lot of risk, you know. I'm not sure exactly where it falls on that trust diagram, but you know, there's definitely a lot of trust that needs to be there in terms of going into something that hasn't been proven yet. Um, uh, maybe they they um, they they believe in my benevolence. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why. So. Yeah. Um, how did we get so lucky to get you as our final keynote? because that was incredible. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna jump in to wrap things up. We can continue these conversations. I know they will. Um, do you have the big book already? I, I, I didn't take one. Okay, so I got, a, I got a big book and a little book for you. Thank you so much. And thank you, James, as well, for moderating. There you go.